a win for journalists and the fight for press freedom. Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. Two renowned reporters from Russia and the Philippines have won this year's Nobel Peace Prize. What message does it send to the powerful in Moscow and Manila? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmakers are Maria Reza and Dmitry Muratov. Well, the bookies had tagged teen climate activist Greta Thunberg as the favorite, but instead, this year's Peace Prize goes to journalists Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov for their efforts to hold the powerful to account. But who are they? Well, Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov founded Novaya Gazeta in 1993. The newspaper is considered one of the only independent outlets in the country and it has been heavily critical of the Kremlin. During Muratov's 24 years as editor-in-chief, six of the paper's journalists have been murdered. This was Muratov speaking on Thursday. The impunity of Politkovskaya's murder, the impunity of Estemirova certainly led to the fact that those who perform repressive maneuvers against Russian journalism think that they have powerful allies, Russian law enforcement agencies and authorities. If they could not solve the murder for 15 years, it probably means that they know but don't want to say. This is exactly how impunity has affected our profession. But despite his criticism of the Kremlin, Moscow applauded the award. We can congratulate Dmitry Muratov. He persistently works in accordance with his own ideals. He's devoted to them. He is talented and he is brave. Just like Dmitry Muratov, Maria Ressa has also paid a price for her critical reporting. Let's take a closer look at the journalist who's never been afraid to challenge powerful people, not even the president. Maria Ressa is the Philippines' first Nobel Prize winner and one of the rare women to be awarded. She co-founded Rappler, a digital news outlet committed to exposing corruption. It's been highly critical of President Rodrigo Duterte and especially of his deadly war on drugs. Rappler's reporting has made Ressa the target of multiple arrest warrants and litigation, forcing her to post bail 10 times since the site was founded. Last year, Maria Ressa joined us here on TRT World, where she spoke about how and why journalism is so crucial right now. The mission of journalism has never been as important as it is today. This is where lies can kill, and the, the ability to demand accountability for government to act in a coherent manner, this is extremely important. You know, when every when the only tool you have for anything is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So even during this pandemic, uh, Duterte, like Bolsonaro, like Trump, threatens, right? And his threats are, uh, are very, very um, straightforward. President Duterte early on declared uh, a state of calamity for six months in March. And then he signed into law, uh, he asked our Congress for, for a, a enhanced emergency powers. And in under these powers, uh, this is where there are tremendous penalties uh, for anyone that the government feels could be working and could be sowing panic among people. So there is a jail sentence and then there's a penalty as well. I think the biggest problem right now that we face, though, is transparency. Keep pushing for transparency because, as, as your reporter said, this, is, this could be the difference between life and death. Now, the Nobel Peace Prize goes all the way back to 1901. Since then, more than 100 individuals and almost 30 organizations have been awarded, but some of the winners have proven controversial. In 1973, U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was recognized for negotiating a ceasefire in Vietnam, but his victory was heavily criticized, considering he'd ordered a deadly bombing raid of Hanoi while negotiating the peace. Some even consider him a war criminal. Aung San Suu Kyi took the prize in 1991 for her fight for democracy and human rights in Myanmar, but after becoming the de facto leader of the country, she refused to condemn the military's brutal treatment of the Rohingya minority. Many are calling for her to be stripped of the honor. Now, Barack Obama made history after becoming the first black U.S. president, and in 2009, just nine months into his first term, he received the Peace Prize. 
but many argued that it came too soon. In 2012, the Nobel Committee decided the European Union deserved recognition for its more than six decades of contributing to peace, reconciliation, democracy, and human rights in Europe. But at the time, the bloc was one of the biggest producers of weapons in the world. And more recently, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed won the award for ending his country's two-decade-long war with Eritrea. But 11 months later, Abiy was waging his own war in the country's northern Tigray region. Let's talk more about this year's winners now, as well as some of the controversy around the prize itself. Joining me from the Norwegian capital is the director of the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, Henrik Ordal. Richard Hedarian joins us from Manila. He's an associate professor of politics at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines and the author of The Rise of Duterte, a Populist Revolt Against Elite Democracy. And from London is human rights activist and co-founder of Forces of Renewal Southeast Asia, Maung Zarni. He's also the author of Myanmar's Enemy of the State Speaks. Thanks all so much for being with us. Richard, let me start with you. You know, this is the first Filipino to be awarded the Nobel Prize for journalism that is not just critical of government, but really critical of anywhere where there's been corruption or, or lack of transparency. What does it mean to your country for Maria Ressa to get this kind of recognition? Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me say that I don't think many people were too surprised by this. I saw some media outlets saying that perhaps there were other favorites we can think about. But I think for a lot of us, we saw the momentum was on the side of, you know, someone like Maria Ressa. She was already on the front page of Time magazine. She was one of the persons of the year, uh, along with our other journalists and, of course, the late Khashoggi. So for her to get this Nobel uh, Peace Prize was not the most surprising thing for us. And in fact, in the Philippines, we are still in the afterglow of getting our first Olympic gold medal uh, by another woman uh, a few, min few months earlier. But I think, of course, this, this means a lot, especially as the Philippines transitions uh, into next elections. President Duterte is already in his twilight months in office. I think in many ways, this is not only a tribute uh, to Philippine journalism, and a lot of people have been holding the line, not only Rappler, but a lot of other journalists in the country. But this might also be a boost to people who are hoping uh, to restore democratic dynamism and the passion uh, for journalism and freedom of expression in the country, which has been characteristic of the Philippines for quite a long time before President Duterte took over in 2016. You know, you're saying it's not a surprise, but would you describe it as a bit of a slap in the face uh, to President Duterte? Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, the, Maria Ressa has been winning a lot of awards, right, <laughs> for the past year or two, right? Uh, so you can say this has been like icing on the cake, but it's a Nobel Peace Prize. It's, it's nothing uh, trivial, right? And I'm sure that a lot of people, the critics of the administration especially, will say, see, uh, you bully someone, you intimidate someone, you want to legally harass someone, and that person stands up, and guess what? That person won our first Nobel Peace Prize. So I think opposition forces, journalists, a lot of people are going to get a lot of boost from this and try to portray President Duterte as the tyrant or the dictator who made this Nobel Peace Prize possible for someone mar like Maria Ries. I think Maria Ries has a new book coming out also, How to Fight a Dictator. So Duterte now is, you know, he's now on the other side of this equation. He's now on the weaker side as he enters his twilight. Uh, months and his opponents now are global heroes. Right, got it. Okay, let me turn to Henrik. You know, um, it may not have been a surprise for people in the Philippines, as Richard was saying, but the name thrown around most was actually uh, Greta Thunberg. But you bet against her, mostly because you say uh, the committee is trying to adhere more closely to the original wishes of Alfred Nobel. Have they done that this year with Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov? I, I think this is a very welcome prize. It's uh, not surprising at all. We've had a media prize on our top uh, five list for the five consecutive years. Uh, with uh, you can think of it in in different constellations, either you know prizes for individual journalists or for uh, organizations like Reporters Without Borders. I think this prize to uh, uh, to these two very courageous uh, journalists in two very different countries, the Philippines and Russia, both speak to the importance uh, of their work in their respective countries, but it also uh, to speaks very loudly to the, sort of the overarching question, which uh, which also the uh, the chairwoman of the uh, committee, Begit Gajs Andersen, elaborated the importance globally of press freedom and independence 
and journalism. Uh, and she says, you know, there is no democracy without uh, press freedom, uh, and that is very much underlying the um, rationale of the of the committee and also the link that Maria Ressa has to um, uh, Reporters Without Borders and their initiative on information and democracy, I think, is is just underlying or underscoring this uh, this relationship uh, uh, initiative that uh, the PRIO has also uh, been supporting. Let me just ask you, though, quickly, Henrik, because, yeah, as we said, you know, people, some people were expecting Greta Thunberg because her name has just been heard everywhere, especially in the last year. And she'd been talked about in the, in the previous year as well. Why don't you think she was the right choice? So I, I think climate change could have been an issue this year, and I'm sure that this is something that the committee is discussing as uh, you know the, the, one of the major issues of our time and 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 the you know major threat, if you like, to human security all over the uh, globe. Uh, I think perhaps if uh, if we would see the committee uh, uh, sort of pointing to climate change as they have in the past with the prize to the IPCC, I think it's more likely that we would see it uh, in an area where. Uh, like, like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, uh, that is the framework that is guiding and aiding the uh, negotiations over climate emission reductions. And I think that would be uh, more appropriate and, and a better way to uh, award uh, multilateral action uh, to reduce the impact of, uh, of climate change. And the other candidate that was also much uh, discussed uh, before the announcement was WHO and their work again, you know, to uh, to curb the effects of the uh, global pandemic. I also think that there are reasons, good reasons, why the WHO was not awarded the prize, both the COVAX, uh, really, uh, the COVAX collaboration to, to try to mm. provide for an equitable uh, vaccine distribution has largely failed, uh, but also there are, you know, remaining questions about WHO and their, uh, the way that they've been handling the pandemic. Right. And, you know, we've seen a few Nobel Prize winners discredited after uh, receiving the award. Maung Zarni, you know intimately about that. I, I read a brief list of some of the more controversial winners on Sung Suu Kyi um, among them at the top of the show. Overall, do you think, though, the prize really is still worthy, worthy of the, the prestige it has given those more controversial winners? Well, I think there are a number. Uh, the, uh, first, let me say that I, I, I want to um, share the joy that uh, Filipino brother and the, uh, the Norwegian scholar uh, uh, express uh, about the decisions to award uh, Russian and Filipino uh, journalists, uh, you know, uh, the, the, that kind of recognition coming from, uh, you know, prestigious institution is very much uh, uh, welcome. Uh, but I've, I've also been a human rights activist for 30 plus years to operating in international political circle at the grassroots level. Uh, but I do have a, a serious, uh, you know, issues and uh, basically three major issues with uh, a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, one is the, uh, you know, the the pattern of some of the extremely disturbing choices going back all the way to Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the you know the, the hit um, also Hitler and Joseph Stalin were both nominees. Of course, like you know, it's not the uh, the responsibility of the Norwegian Nobel Committee who got nominated, but the the decisions to award uh, Henry Kissinger uh, in 1973 before the Vietnam War uh, ended, but specifically stated, uh, stating in the citation for uh, uh, Kissinger's award that uh, he and uh, his Vietnam, not Vietnamese counterpart would share this. And not Vietnamese counterpart did not want to have anything to do with the uh, Real politic monster, and then like you know this, the in the in the same year Kissinger got involved in, uh, you know, overthrow of uh, right. Chilean. Uh, that that was know. definitely flawed. I mean, as we said, some people actually do consider Kissinger a war criminal. Yeah, that, um, that like uh, Andrea, you, I mean, you've got the current uh, Ethiopian president who just got awarded. Exactly. And Obama was awarded and, in, on the twelve. I mean, not awarded, nominated on the 12th day of his presidency. Right. You know, these let, let, me, let me bring it forward, though. I mean, do you fear, then, what has happened to Kissinger, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, and the others could actually happen to Maria Ressa or Dmitry Muratov, or is it unlikely because, actually, they're not in government? 
No, the, uh, I think the, these two individuals, they, they are fighting against uh, authoritarian regimes and uh, fighting to highlight uh, the, uh, the corruption, crim uh, crimes against humanity and uh, whatnot. They are not fighting to get into power to shape the national politics. And so the chances of these two distinguished individuals going the way of Aung San Suu Kyi or Ethiopian leader or Henry Kissinger uh, it's very low. But my, my point is much more fundamental than that. You know, one is that uh, uh, the, you know, the revolutions or political struggles for a better future, these are collective efforts, collective actions and, you know, individuals being singled out as deserving as they are. Uh, it's a conceptually and morally a bit, uh, you know, uh, shaky. And then secondly, Norway uses the Nobel Prize as a, a way of um, embellishing is, uh, the image internationally, whereas, in fact, Norway has been in so many different dodgy international uh, situations. And uh, this is the economy. I mean, the country that has built um, its wealth, uh, you know, over a fossil fuel, and then like it went to, okay. you know, the committee awarded, uh, you know, a goal for environmental protection while the country is pumping fossil fuel. I mean, like, let's that, uh, that, let's so let's ask Henrik a little bit more about that, if if you don't mind. I mean, Henrik, do you think that's fair? And also, let me ask you if you think there could be, at least on behalf of the Nobel Committee, more foresight. Um, for example, on, you know, Abiy Ahmed uh, and, um, and Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, you know, to have them further examine before they give these awards, is there any way they could have been more kind of suspect as to what might happen um, with the Rohingya in Myanmar or the Tigray in Ethiopia? Well, well, thank you for asking. I think Dr. Sarney has a, has a lot of valid points, and I, I'm certainly not going to defend the... Uh, the uh, Norwegian government on all accounts, but I do think it is important to underscore that the committee is completely independent of the uh, of the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Norwegian Parliament. Uh, so they're making their decisions, and we saw, you know, with the uh, the prize to ICANN a few years uh, back, which was certainly not uh, not uh, necessarily sort of supporting Norwegian interests, that the committee is indeed independent. Then I think we have to separate, uh, and I, I concur with uh, with the uh, the. Um, uh, claim that you know some of these prizes historically uh, are are uh, you know quite quite challenging. The the one to the clerk uh, who shared the prize with Manila back in '93 is another one. But mm -hmm. um, I think I I, I want to separate between you know the I, I think it would be uh, completely erroneous to say that that the prize to Aung San Suu Kyi was was wrong back in 1991. She was a human rights defender and a pro democracy activist back then. I don't think you can blame the committee for what is happening 25 30 years down the road. Uh, but of course the prize. Uh, you know, can and, and you can retrieve the prize. You cannot take it back. Uh, but of course, the prize now serves as a platform for criticizing uh, Aung San Suu Kyi for her role in the uh, in uh, with the Rohingyas. And I think that is, you know, probably giving uh, her and uh, and the issue more attention uh, than uh, it would have get gotten if it had not been for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Henry, but I do think, it's, uh, yeah. Why can't you take it back? I mean, aren't we kind of at a point now where actually stripping someone of the award could be just as powerful as giving? It to them and make as strong of a statement. That, that's a fair point. Uh, this is just not part of the regulations, and, and that goes for all the Nobel Prizes. So this is not something that Norway can decide unilaterally either. Uh, so, so this is just a way that the Nobel system is set up, and you can, you know, easily imagine that there would be, you know, a, a, a an ongoing, ever ongoing discussion about, you know, what prizes that uh, that uh, you know stand uh, the the time of uh, uh, the, the the wear of time. But I, I do think it is a point, uh, regardless that you know, have you received a Nobel Peace Prize, you're held to a much higher your standard than you are otherwise. So uh, we, we shouldn't, uh, you know, discount the, the possibility of, uh, of the prize also, you know, being a platform for criticizing Nobel laureates who are not living up to these expectations. And I think can this I, is what I, is what we're seeing yeah, with, with the Ethiopian you? Prime Minister now. And I, I, I agree that I think the uh, the prize was premature. Uh, but keep in mind also that the prize was awarded not for, uh, you know, what he was doing in Tigray, but with for the peace prize, or sorry, for the, the peace agreement Eritrea. Uh, with Eritrea. Right. So uh, but again, I, let me yeah. let Zarni yeah. get in there very quickly, and then I want to come back to Richard. Yeah, Go yeah, ahead, Zarni. Like, this is, you know, this is a perennial, mm -hmm. global, pervasive issue. These, you know, normative standards of human behavior, what is considered virtue and virtuous, 
is decided by the white uh, colonial West, whether, you know, the uh, human rights or whatnot. I, I, I am for fundamental basic uh, acceptance of human rights as a human norm. But when, you know, when we have prizes in Asia, like Maxese Prize in the Philippines, it's, you know, it's a, it's a prestigious award. And then Guangzhou Award from Korea, the Western media do not pay attention to these, you know, uh, uh, you know, influential and prestigious continental prizes, only focus on Nobel Prize. So I think that there is a colonial aspect to this, you know, even like Time okay. Magazine. Person of the year is deeply problematic. Why do the white West have to be the you know arbiter of what is normatively virtuous and noble? That is a major, major issue for Let me, everyone. Okay. I mean, in colonization, it's an interesting point. But I mean, this this award was just happened to be created by Alfred Nobel with his endowment uh, and this money. It just happens to be there, and the world over, for for whatever reasons, has given it uh, this level of prestige. And in many ways, no, it it's not manufactured through massive media. Okay, uh, you know, but I mean. Uh, 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 Fine, you know, the, the media is, then we're all responsible for it. We're giving it this attention now. You're participating in this show. <laughs> media and the, those who reproduce, you know, on the okay. grassroots side. So, so this is, you know, in the age of Black Lives Matter, you know, if you look, you have to look at things from a decolonial perspective, philanthropy, Fair enough. the media. Academia. Let, Richard, I just want to get your thoughts on that. If you really do believe that the, the, the history of the Nobel Prize and where its origins are is an issue. Well, I, I think we cannot blame folks in Norway for happening to be from a Western country or people from certain racial background. But I absolutely agree with it. You know, the idea that perhaps we have to give more attention to alternative awards that also recognize great contributions to humanity. So I'm very glad that other awards from Korea, from Philippines, among others were mentioned. I mean, as far as the history of the Nobel Peace Prize is concerned, one of the things that really got my attention throughout the years, and I happened to watch it was, I mean, not in person, but, but quite live on TV, was the awarding of President Barack Obama. And that really seemed initially very premature and questionable, right? Okay. Like, this guy just won the award. And, but, but, you know, to a certain degree, I would say that although Obama wanted to push back against ideas that, oh, this will constrain him, I think eventually if you look at the foreign policy of Obama when he needs to reach out to Cuba, to Iran, among others, you could also make an argument that sometimes it may have been awarded prematurely, but it may have also normatively constrained the coordinates of strategic imagination of certain leaders. It was a gamble, but I think that gamble worked to a certain degree with President Obama, or arguably, I would, I'm willing to make that. Okay, you know what, Mong, Mong we, need to, we only have two minutes left, and I really do need to get to one last thing uh, with, with, uh, with Richard. It's, it is important, because we actually, we gave uh, the Kremlin's response at the, at the top of the program, um, in response, of course, to Dmitry Muratov winning this prize as well. Uh, the Kremlin, outright congratulated uh, Dmitry Moratov. They called him talented and brave. We haven't yet heard from President Duterte, Richard, and I'm wondering uh, if you think he might respond in kind. He's, uh, well, President Duterte is largely an absently landlord, so sometimes we don't know if he's still awake, if he's still around, and I'm, I'm saying this completely seriously. We don't know where the hell this guy is sometimes, right? But, but I'm sure he's spokesman. Uh, who ironically is a human rights lawyer in, and is running for a position at the United Nations as a human rights lawyer, may have something or two to say on this uh, shortly. We hope to hear some. I'm sure they're going to give some pro forma congratulatory statement, but I think uh, a lot of the propagandists and supporters of the administration will try to dismiss this or raise the issue of Kissinger, among others, or all of these anti-colonial <laughs> arguments that was raised legitimately by our good friend from Myanmar to actually disparage and besmirch uh, this, I think, well-deserved well recognition of the contribution of Marie Ressa. I mean, I think this is the problem we have. While I agree that we have to move away from, from domination of the West, the problem is that many authoritarian populist leaders like Duterte have been using the same anti-colonial arguments to also justify their kind of rule, some would even say very authoritarian and despotic kind of rule. You, let me ask you, Richard, yeah, I mean, as for Maria, you know, she said that the, the pressure from the government, the constant litigation, uh, the arrest warrants against her have been like death by a thousand cuts. Do you think this honor 
has maybe helped eliminate some of those cuts? And mm -hmm. what kind of pressure do you think she's going to be under now to continue to deliver? Well, I mean, all due respect to, to uh, Maria Ress and all credit to her. Uh, but to be honest, I'm more uh, concerned for her, for her staff, for for younger reporters who are based in the Philippines and more exposed. I'm more concerned for countless other unnamed and unsung heroes, journalists in the Philippines who have been resisting the excesses of the Duterte administration. So while I very much welcome Maria Ressa representing the best that is in the Philippine journalism, I hope that this will also serve as a recognition for unsung heroes. A thousand other journalists, young reporters, some of them have been targeted, some of them have faced far worse situation uh, than Maria Ressa, who gladly has had the global support, you know, legal support, institutional support, but there are many other reporters who have had not that. And hopefully this award will give inspiration to a young generation of journalists and academics and activists in the Philippines to continue this great tradition of free journalism in, in, in our country. Okay, Richard, we're going to have to leave it there. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us. Uh, and thank our viewers as well for tuning in. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.